Welcome to something to wrestle with. Welcome to wrestle with. Bruce Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooed it. She pooed it. What a rib. No, you have a There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. I ain't scared of shit. Fuck him. Thank you, Bruce. I love you. Double cheeseburger. Double cheese. Bruce Pritchard. Uh, it's very interesting to me because um, we kind of get to this Vince NWO storyline pretty quickly. Uh, on the January 14th edition of SmackDown, he does this famous promo that most of us remember where he's talking to himself in a mirror, talking about how the WWF had cancer because of Ric Flair and how he had no choice but to do what he has to do. And he wasn't going to talk himself out of it. At one point, he starts shaking with his eyes rolling into his head and saying it feels good. And then he says he's not going to let Ric Flair kill what he created because he's going to kill what he created. And he's going to inject the WWF with a lethal dose of poison. Uh, He says he's going to kill it and hit with him and the NWO. And he swings around in his chair and it has the NWO letters painted on the back of the chair. Did you produce that segment? I did. Um, where was that shot? Was that shot at TV day of? It was shot at TV day of. We took a small, like a single dressing room. It was we had to build a damn platform for the the look that we wanted because the way that the mirrors were. So we had to build a platform that was going to raise Vince's chair up quite a bit and. Then, you know, we did the NWO letters backwards on the back of the chair so it would read correctly in the reflection in the mirror. And a lot of lighting effects, remember, is really dark and kind of goofy in there. But, yeah, that was was me and Vince locked in a room for a long time. The whole segment is uh, broken down and shown throughout SmackDown, and it's a little over eight minutes long in total, and it was very well done. Uh, So kudos to you guys for doing it. But what sticks out to me is that Meltzer would report in the February 4th Observer that they didn't sign their contracts until late January. And this promo is happening on the 14th of January. Is that accurate? And, And if the guys had not signed... Oh my God, Dave Meltzer wasn't accurate? Yeah, Dave Meltzer was not accurate. Okay, you made the Home Alone face, but this is an audio podcast, so if you're going to do... I did it again. (laughs) If you're going to do silent movie gags, you you need to remember that this isn't a video show yet. Yet. Um, Okay, let's move along. Um, Yeah, no, Meltzer was incorrect. They they were signed. They were ready. We, We wouldn't have done it if we didn't have them. So there's a story going around, and this could just be internet legend at this point, but supposedly uh, the Dudley boys are there, and Scott Hall's trying to be chummy with them, and says something along the lines of, hey man, I love your finish, what do you call that? And they tell him, oh, it's the Dudley death drop, we appreciate that, thanks man. And he says, yeah man, it looks great, I can't wait to kick out of it. And that supposedly... Rubs them the wrong way. Now, I feel like that's just good-natured ribbing, but given the climate at the time where there's been speeches about these guys being like everybody else and nothing's changing and don't worry, it might feel like more than that. Do you remember hearing this story? I've heard the story, and I take it exactly as you just laid it out, that it was a rib. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just good-natured, ball-busting, and, and uh, that doesn't that's Scott seem, Hall. Yeah. He, he says that kind of shit to, to everybody. But I think maybe the timing of it, coupled with everything else going on at the time, and tensions, it's like, well, what the fuck? This guy's going to kick out of my finish? <laughs> right. I, do, I think that just grew legend unto itself. We haven't mentioned yet, but this uh, pay-per-view is happening in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's at the Bradley Center. It's February 17th. And they actually start the pay-per-view with the three guys making their debut. 
and they use their old NWO music. Uh, they actually turn the color on the television to black and white as they walk to the ring, and they get a huge pop. Uh, and Jim Ross made mention on commentary how they did more to destroy WCW than any other entity. That, that joke writes itself. Once they got in the ring, uh, Nash was the first to speak. He talked about the amount of heat they had with the boys and that they got frightening stares. And then he talked about the words that have been used to describe them. Uh, he says they want a fair chance and a clean slate to prove to you great fans that nobody does it quite like us. Hall's next to speak. Of course, he starts with, hey, yo. And he says that uh, they're not the bad hey, guys. Yo. They're fans, and they just want the opportunity to work with all the great WWF superstars. And they didn't want any trouble because deep down, they're just like you. And then Hogan takes the mic and gets a huge pop before he even speaks with lots of fans starting the Hogan chants. And then in says that Scott and Kevin were right. And they're just like all the fans, just a little richer and a little more famous, but we're not here to kill the WWF. We're here to make it better. And he thanked Vince McMahon for the opportunity and that he wouldn't let him down. He says, God bless Vince McMahon and God bless all of you. And he closed with God bless America. And thank you for the chance. So this is obviously written pretty sarcastically here, Bruce, but at the same time, it's done. So to maybe create some doubt in the minds of the fans, are they good guys? Are they bad guys? Uh, later on in the show, during the main event, it's uh, Chris Jericho defending his undisputed championship against Steve Austin. The NWO runs in and attacks Austin, including Hall hitting him with the Stone Cold Stunner and allowing Jericho to defeat him and retain the title. And then they spray paint NWO on Austin's back. Uh, what was the reaction to this? Did Austin have any programs or any problems with this program as far as them coming in and getting the heat on him right away? Or would this been something that Austin volunteered for since this is going to be the new hot angle? I want in on that. Well, I don't think Steve volunteered for it, but he didn't have necessarily a problem with doing it because it was a way to introduce the NWO and to put the NWO where we wanted them as heels. So you attack, you know, the top baby faces. But he didn't have a problem with it that I can remember. Um, the next night on Raw, the show opens up with Austin coming out to the ring, and he demands the NWO come down. They end up coming out, but they stay at the top of the ramp, and after a few minutes of going back and forth, they just go back to the dressing room. Austin ends up getting arrested, and after the commercial break, he's in the back of the cop car with the NWO standing there looking at him, and Hall is mocking him. Um, so did you guys know right away, okay, here's our plan. We're going to program Hall with Austin because it feels like even in their first night with him doing the stunner and then mocking him the next night that that was the plan right away. It's going to be Hall and Austin. It was. And because we wanted to have somewhere to go. So we figured you people would be looking for that, uh, Austin Hulk match. Don't give it to him right away. Let's build to that. And let's, let's get, people behind it let's get him them demanding it really wanting it so the idea was to go hall nash um hall nash hall and austin and rock and hogan felt those were the two best matchups for the first time matchups that seems really crazy to me that you guys wouldn't try to book hogan austin i mean it never happened but it seems like it would have been awesome and, you know, obviously, I'm not disappointed with what we got, so calm the fuck down. I'm just saying. Rock, rock, and, rock and Hulk was just as attractive. You got to do one of them first. If we had done Austin and, and Hulk, they said, God damn, why didn't you guys do Rock and Hulk? It was right there. You got to do one of them. So in your head, Austin is not a notch above Rock. They're 1A and 1B. I, yeah, at that time, they were pretty damn equal. Okay. Um, later in the show, the NWO shown outside the building, getting ready to leave, but Hogan says they have to attend to some personal business. Um, so to come back and get him in about half an hour. And then later Hogan comes out to a huge pop and there's giant chance of Hogan. Um, Meltzer says he said they'd done it all together, fought the Russians, slammed the 700 pound Andre. And then the fans turned on him, drove him out of the WWF. And he said he's been waiting many years, and now he could finally deliver an important message to the fans. Kiss my ass. He said he built pro wrestling, and there was no bigger star past or present than him. 
So the rock comes out, does the big stare down where they look one direction and the other. Uh, and then half the crowd's chanting Rocky. The other half is chanting Hogan. And the rock challenges him to a match at WrestleMania 18. Uh, Hogan took quite a bit of time to answer, but finally agreed. And they shook hands. Good luck. Hogan said, you're going to need it. And then the rock replied, not as much as you brother and gives him the rock bottom. So the rock walks up the ramp and then he's immediately jumped by Hall and Nash. Um, they throw rock into the ring and Hogan starts whipping him with his leather belt. Hall gives him the razor's edge and Nash hits him with the jackknife power bomb. Hogan goes outside, gets a hammer <laughs> and it hits rock in the back of the head with it. Uh, and then gives him the big leg drop because that's, I mean, that's the death blow, not the hammer, damn the, head, right. the leg drop. Hammer's just going to get him down by God. But once you drop that leg, shiznit's over. <laughs> and then, uh, Hall with the entire crowd counts the pinfall and then they spray paint rock. So, you know, the night before they, they leave Austin laying and spray paint him the next night, they leave rock laying and spray paint him. Um, but the thing that everybody really remembers from this is the first time Hogan and rock are facing off and they just don't do anything and just look to the crowd and everybody's going nuts. Is that something that are there two better guys that know how to do that than the rock and Hulk Hogan to just milk the crowd like that? They were the best. They were great. They knew it. You feel it. That's what's missing today is feeling and emotion. So, yeah, they were great, man. They just went out there and felt it and went with it. I, um, I'm curious what the reaction was backstage. Were you in gorilla when that's going on? I probably was or close to it. When you're seeing this happen on the screen, what's Vince's reaction? Well, it, the reaction to what the reaction to the stare down and the reaction yes. of the crowd. Yes. Loving it. Because the audience was into it. It was two of the biggest stars the business had ever seen, old and young. The old stud and the young buck in there. And the crowd was eating it up. They really wanted it. Uh, who wrote the uh, promo for Hogan? Is this something that at this point we're scripting word for word? Or is this bullet points? And who, who's kind of going over and coaching him up on this? Is this something he's working with Vince on? Pro probably Brian Gewertz and Vince. Okay. Brian uh, was a great writer. Why Why in Cafe Blend is there no one to come help The Rock if they're allegedly here to kill the entire company when they start, you know, smashing the top guys here, Rock and Austin, and back-to-back -back nights? Where are all the baby faces? I think that Vince had uh, put out an edict that if anyone comes out and tries to save them, they'd be fired. Okay. I think I was, uh, I'm saying that was like part of the storyline sure. of the show. Sure, sure. Um, so after the commercial, here's where we start getting to the fun stuff. They load the rock into an ambulance. And as they tried to leave, the NWO stopped them with a big semi truck. And then they start beating the hell out of the ambulance with crowbars. Uh, they chained up the ambulance. So rock who was unconscious could not escape. Uh, and then Hogan, wink, wink, drove the semi at about a hundred miles an hour into the side of the ambulance. Uh, and those in the building have said the crowd was like, 40%, 50% behind the NWO during this angle. They're cheering on the rock, uh, being attacked inside the ambulance. And Hogan is so excited that he did crotch chops. Uh, and the NWO then looks into the back of the ambulance, presumably to see the rocks remains and then run off into the night. And Jim Ross famously says tragedy has struck a WWF superstar. Uh, what are your memories of, of doing this? Did y'all shoot this the night before? No, we shot it uh, the night of. Wow. And it, it was pre-taped. It was very ambitious. It was friggin' cold in Chicago. But that was a, a Vince McMahon production. We had everybody out there, and we did pre-tape it, make sure everybody was safe. But it got done uh, while the show was taking place inside the arena and then it aired as as if it was live and i dare say it, it worked out worked out pretty good and jr kind of summed it up because tragedy had struck a wwf superstar and if tragedy has struck anyone in your family 
I'd go to rgtaylorforlaw.com for some good legal advice. All right, y'all, listen up. Prize Picks is the most fun I've had, winning 25x my money this football season. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. Testing my skills on prize picks this football season is the most exciting way to play da- daily fantasy sports. And if you have the skills, you can turn 10 bucks into $250 with just a few taps. It really is simple to play prize picks. You can make your picks and sol- submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. They've also got quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and really just an enormous selection of players and stat types. And that is why prize picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app. This week on Prize Picks, man, you could make all sorts of different projections. Who would have thought a couple of weeks ago that Aaron Rodgers, you could ch- you could choose more or less three passing touchdowns? We know how that worked out for him. But you could still be a big winner on betting on guys like Odo Beckham. Will he have more than 50 yards? Or what about Josh Allen? Will he have more than two passing touchdowns? That's it. You pick these combinations of players. You think about the different stat lines. Yeah, I think he'll have more than this. Oh, I think he'll have less than this. Bam, you're in the game. And Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. You see, each Tuesday, Prize Picks discount select player projections by up to 25%. That provides even more value to us. And great news Prize Pick now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account. Make it happen this football season. You're absolutely going to love it. I have to tell you, I was pulling for my man Tua this past weekend. I'm going to pull for him every single weekend. And Prize Picks is going to make it fun for you to enjoy football in a whole new way. I know I am. I'm having fun. I'm making money. That's a win win. Go right now to prizepicks.com slash wrestle and use the code wrestle for a first deposit match of up to a hundred bucks. That's prizepicks.com slash wrestle. Use our code wrestle for a first deposit match of up to a hundred bucks. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Now the tag team we're talking about today, of course, most remember as ax and smash. Um, and, and there were other members that we'll get into than the traditional, uh, two that most are familiar with, but the debut actually went down before you were there, Bruce. It was January of 1987. We're going to touch on that briefly. Uh, most of us remember smash as Barry Darso, uh, but he was formerly in the Jim Crockett promotions and working lots of independents doing a Russian gimmick as crusher crew chef. Uh, so he's appearing all over in the NWA doing that character. Uh, and some of our younger fans may remember him as repo man and blacktop bully. Uh, neither one of those were nearly as successful as Crusher Khrushchev and Smash. Uh, but when Smash was originally debuted, it wasn't Barry Darso. Who was it? It was a gentleman by the name of Randy Colley, who most people will probably remember as Moondog Rex. And Moondog Rex is, is one half of the Moondogs tag team. And uh, for those younger listeners who aren't familiar with the Moon Dogs, can you describe their gimmick or tell us some of their favorite memories or matches, or what can you share with us about the Moon Dogs? Well, the Moon Dogs were a unique combination of guys. They both had bleach blonde, almost white hair, and I don't really know what the hell how you could classify the gimmick, but they both wore jeans that were kind of cut off with rope. Uh, for belts and they chewed on giant bones so they were moon dogs the original moon dog lonnie main i guess they were kind of a takeoff on uh moon dog main way back in the day but they were very colorful you had moon dog spot who was sailor white thomas and moon dog rex who was randy collie and there was another moon dog out there from time to time as well so let's talk a little bit about uh, how that comes about, because there's lots of rumor and innuendo that um, Demolition is actually Randy Colley's idea. And I think Bill Eady is the guy who's kind of put this out there. Um, and then, of course, I know they debuted a little while before you joined, but what do you remember about whose idea this Demolition concept was? Was it Randy Colley's? Was it Vince McMahon's? Who deserves the credit for this, to the best of your knowledge? Well, obviously, as you stated several times, I wasn't there when it uh, came out, but I do know from talking to Randy Colley, because I remember Randy way back from his nightmare days in the uh, Mid-South Wrestling, and I've always heard that it was Randy Colley's idea, that Randy approached Vince with this idea 
of a tag team with the masks and the makeup, and they put uh, he and Bill Eady together. So from my best recollection, the original idea or the germ of the idea was Randy Colley's. So uh, how would you best describe in, in a few words what the demolition gimmick is? And, and a lot of people are going to hear me ask that and say, oh, it was a Road Warrior ripoff, but it was a little different. Uh, but it was certainly after the Road Warriors, and we'll address the Road Warrior thing in a minute. But first, how would you describe it? I think if you were going to describe demolition, they were just two big stuff, uh, two big tough guys that kind of demolish all of their opponents, and they were rough and tough, and a very rugged tag team. I think that's the best way to describe them. Catch me up a little bit about, uh, and, and I'm fascinated by this because I, I didn't see it until later. Uh, obviously, I was a kid, but they kind of look a little bit like, you know, S and M character. Yeah. So where does that <laughs> where does that come about? Does anybody? Do you remember that kind of being the talk in the back amongst the boys as a kid? Of course, I didn't know what the hell that was. But uh, now that I know who Jim Cornette is, I know exactly what S and M is. What the hell? It was it was a joke. Um, These are jokes. We tell jokes on the show. Yes, folks. It's it's, it's this. That's the part where you go, ha ha, um, and then you tweet Jim Cornette, and then I get the phone call. But uh, demolition and the the whole outlook, yeah, a little bit uh, dominatrix ish, if you're into that sort of thing. But uh, I think there was also kind of a play on Jason from the Friday the Thirteenth movies as well that was. It was playing in there as well they were trying to go for so let's talk about that um because that is part of their iconic um outfit is the mask uh with i guess it's a piece a piece of leather affixed to the back uh and i guess uh as far as you understand were the original masks spray painted or were they covered with leather you know that's a damn good question. I, I think that they were always kind of uh, had the leather front on them. The ones that I ever saw up close, I don't. I think they were always leather. That's but my recollection. I, I felt like at one point I have seen some of the paint coming off, but that may have been when they added somebody like, you know, hacksaw for a one-off or something when he would paint his face. But essentially, it is just a hockey mask that you guys kind of gimmicked up with leather and studs and stuff. What, when you were there, was that something that the the costume department was putting together, or in '87 did that really exist? Were the guys coming up with it on their own? It, at that point, it was probably possibly could have been some creative department came up with, but the guys were responsible for getting all of that stuff made and maintaining it. So they probably would have been responsible for that themselves. The talent would have been. All right, so let's move away from the costume for a minute. I'm sure we'll come back uh, eventually here. Um, after a few appearances together, uh, Edie has went on record as saying that too many people recognize Collie from being one of the Moon Dogs, so they decide to replace him. And Edie says the WWF suggested four other guys who were currently working in the WWF at the time to replace Collie, uh, but Edie didn't think it would work because he felt the fans would recognize those guys as other WWF performers, similar to the way they had the Moon Dogs. Um, and it wasn't too long before this that Barry Dorso had reached out and contacted the WWF once his NWA contract had expired. And when Vince suggests Darso, Edie drives down to Charlotte, his old stomping grounds, to meet Darso. And from there, the demolition we all know was born. Uh, so that's Edie's testimony. Is that the way you remember it going down? That's the way that I heard it went down, yes. And I've heard directly from Vince that it was simply too much with people when they did uh, Randy Colley under the demolition face paint and so on and so forth that the crowds, especially in the Northeast, were chanting moon dog, moon dog every time that Randy got into the ring. And he, Vince just didn't feel that was going to work and decided they needed to get someone else. So I'm curious, you know what's coming here. If, if it's Randy's idea... And the WWF and Demolition made a mint with this, or I guess Edie and Darso did. Do you know, did, did Kali ever receive any sort of compensation, to the best of your understanding, for, for coming up with this iconic gimmick that everybody made money from except him? Probably not, but again, you know, when you talk about guys coming up with ideas, people come up with ideas all the time and other people use them. 
And Vince is notorious for that, that someone may give him an idea and he'll use it for someone else. And that's one of the first things that he'll tell you uh, when you talk to him, especially if you're talking about creative and say, hey, Vince, I've got an idea. He'll say, hey, I really like that. I don't see it for you, but I see it for someone else. And he'll use it for somebody else. Do you think that's, that, just, that's he, just the creative world that happens every day in Hollywood, television, music? It's the way it works. Do you think that that is fair, or you know, life's not fair, pal? Life's not fair, and you, you can go through uh, a singer at a country fair doing an original song, and Steven Tyler listens to it and picks up on it. He makes it famous. Is that fair? You know, he's he's the one that made it famous. So um, that's just the creative game and how it goes sometimes. People, you may hear an idea or someone will say something to somebody else six times removed by the time it gets to you. It may have been someone else's original idea. But you've heard me say a million times, somebody will say something, I'll go, I'm stealing that. Yeah. I'm making my own. Well, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just wondered, especially since there's been a recent controversy, and I'm not trying to take too much of a sidetrack here, with the whole broken gimmick and and the Jarrett situation and the WWE and the Hardys and, you know, who owns it. And and the contention there is more of always a, a music analogy of the publisher is the person who owns the rights. So in this case, you would agree that... It's Vince's company. The idea happened when it was under Vince's watch. So one way or another, Vince owns Demolition, not Kali or Edie or anybody else. Yeah, I think that's the way that most people see it. So let's get into some background on both guys. Uh, we've said his name a few times. Axe was Bill Edie, and uh, he was said that he got into the business you know, kind of an accident. Uh, he's home for summer break from college one year. His neighbor was one of the athletic commissioners in Pennsylvania, uh, and he invited Bill to go to the Pittsburgh Civic Center just to see a wrestling show. Uh, when he went, he got to go into the locker room and meet a lot of the guys. And the promoter that night asked if he'd ever thought about getting into wrestling because he was a big guy. Uh, so a few weeks later, he starts training with Larry Zabisco to become a professional wrestler. Uh, and then after his wrestling career, he went on to become a teacher. Uh, and he would teach in Ohio. Uh, and before Edie became Axe, you may remember him, some of our older listeners, as the mass Superstar. Um, and he wrestled as the Super Machine for a little bit in the WWF, um, Bolo Mongol, and he did you know kind of a, a rip-off indie gimmick of Demolition. But Demolition is certainly, and I know a lot of older fans are going to disagree with this because they're they're marks for the Mass Superstar. But Demolition is his most iconic run in the business. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I think that prob probably for this generation is going to be Demolition. To me, he was always the mass superstar. And to me, the, the, the mass superstar gimmick was such a strong gimmick. And it was the first time that I met Bill and actually got to be around him. And I thought he was um, an incredible performer. So, you know, I think that he's been successful from the Mongols to the mass superstar on to Demolition or, or all three pretty damn good gimmicks. Um, Barry grew up, Barry Darso grew up in Minnesota, and this is something we've talked about a lot on the show here. For whatever reason, Minnesota was a hotbed for wrestling during this point. Uh, he grows up as friends with the Road Warriors, Mr. Perfect, Wayne Bloom, uh, Brady Boone, Nikita Koloff, John Nord, and Tony Schiavone's favorite wrestler, Tom Zink. Uh, they all start working out at the gym together, uh, and they're bouncers at a bar that a lot of wrestling fans have heard about, Grandma B's. Uh, one day, Grandma B's, Darso meets Eddie Sharkey, who we've talked about on the Kurt Henning and Rick Rude shows, on the, available now in the archives. Sharkey sees how big these guys are and recruits them all to become wrestlers. Uh, and Sharkey had rented out a church basement, and that's where they have a wrestling ring with a homemade ring and wooden beams. Uh, and then one day... Ole Anderson comes to take a look at him, and he took Animal, who was their first guy in the group, to get in the business, uh, and then Dorso would get in after that. So as the mass Superstar, who you mentioned a minute ago, we should mention that Bill Eady is one of the first guys to body slam Andre the Giant. Uh, there's all the rumor and innuendo out there, the WWE narrative, that that didn't happen before WrestleMania three, but that's, of course, not true. Harley Race and Bill Eady and a few others did as well. And Eddie had significant success in Georgia, uh, winning their heavyweight title four times uh, and eventually the NWA national heavyweight title. 
Uh, he had a run in the WWF prior to demolition as the mass superstar uh, for 83 and 84. We mentioned it a minute ago. You would see uh, him have matches with Hulk Hogan, Bob Backlund, Jimmy Snuka, Sergeant Slaughter, all the major players. And then in 86, he became one of the machines, which is kind of a fun thing they did in 86. You would see Blackjack as Big Machine, Andre the Giant as Giant Machine, and Edie was Super Machine. And they had a brief run against the Heenan family there. Uh, and that causes, you know, when that run kind of dies down, Edie leaves uh, and becomes the mass superstar in Florida. And he had a brief run there where he beat Lex Luger for the Southern title and then just dropped it back a couple weeks after. Meanwhile, Darso is starting his career in Hawaii and New Zealand and then on to the NWA. Uh, he's bouncing around as part of this Russian group with Ivan uh, and Nikita Koloff, and they had a hot feud with the Road Warriors and the Rock and Roll Express and the NWA and even a tag title run there. Uh, he even went to uh, win the Mid-Atlantic title uh, at some point before his run winds up coming to an end in December of 86. Uh, so Edie and Darso in their incarnation as demolition. Now that Kali's out debut on February 8th on the wrestling challenge against SD Jones and Don Driggers. We haven't talked a lot about SD Jones here on the show before. Do you got any SD Jones stories you can share? Special delivery SD Jones. Um, you know, SD was one of those guys who was from the Dominican Republic and, he was a great enhancement talent and just was missing that that one little extra it factor to break on through to the other side, if you will. Um, great hand, great guy, dependable, but uh, he was just missing it, in my opinion. But, you know, you talk, you talk about Bill Eady and, and being before the demolition and stuff. One of his runs as mass superstar was through the Mid-South area. And that was during the uh, three-week run that Terry Taylor had as a booker in Mid-South. I don't know how long he was there. Three weeks was probably too long. But one of the wor all-time worst territory town-killing finishes that ever took place in the Houston ring was done with Bill Eady, Dick Murdoch, and uh, Ted DiBiase and Dr. Death, where... The finish of the match was to unmask the mass superstar. And Edie was on his way out. Murdoch was on his way out. Murdoch hated Terry Taylor. Edie quit because of Terry Taylor. And this was their last night in the territory. So they do a finish where you're supposed to unmask the guy. And everybody, when you have that finish, the audience is there to see the masked guy get unmasked and to see his face. So they do the finish. The heels go to the back into the dressing room. Edie still with his mask. Edie walks in the dressing room. DiBiase and Doc act like they're beating the door down. And Edie tosses Ted a mask. Ted goes back out to the ring and holds the mask up. People never got to see Bill's face. But worse than that, Edie worked in a black mask and threw a red mask out to Ted for Ted to go back out like he unmasked him. He's got a red mask. Which is just a bullshit finish, and uh, you know one of the reasons that probably Terry didn't didn't last that long as far as being a booker in the business. Well, um, so there you go. There's a little bit of, uh, and I didn't even know all that. So that's a, a little bit of history lesson for us who maybe we're more familiar with Edie as a demolition member. You know, I feel like sooner or later we're just going to have to talk about it. In your opinion. Uh, and I know you've talked about this a lot on the show in the past, but uh, some some people are probably listening to this episode first. You've always you've always been of the belief that demolition is not a ripoff of the Road Warriors. Sell us on that. A lot of people are just of the opinion that Vince tried to sign the Road Warriors, and I guess I should ask that first. Do you know for sure that the Road Warriors? received an offer and had a conversation and had a meeting with Vince at his house for a deal before demolition debut. I, that I don't know. Cause I wasn't there. Uh, I'd always heard that Vince was interested in the road warriors. Um, and, uh, what's his name? Collie had this idea for demolition and Vince went with demolition. I also remember, um, a meeting after I got there with, the road warriors and Vince. And I don't even know if they met in person or not, but I do remember 
getting the phone call and being with uh, Vince where he said, we're, we're going full steam ahead with uh, demolition and powers of pain. Because the Road Warriors decided that they were not going to come in. And I want to say that that was sometime late 1987, early 1988. In your opinion, had demolition, um, had, had the Road Warriors come in, would demolition have essentially been become cannon fodder for the Road Warriors? Would they have existed where they created to just um, be an opponent for an eventual feud with the Road Warriors, but when they didn't sign, Vince just kind of went the other way with it? Well, I definitely think that they would have had a program, but I, again, I, I think that they were different enough, and the Road Warriors at the time had just that cult following, and they had a huge babyface following. Demolition were heels, and they were classic heels, especially in the WWF. And people, I didn't believe this, I didn't know it, until you're there, and you, you really don't get it. People were either NWA and Crockett fans, or they were WWF fans. WWF fans, everything WWF was the greatest of all time. And NWA was a subpar regional promotion nwa fans were the nwa was real wrestling where real wrestlers are and this is the best matches and the wwf was new york hollywood crap so you really had two strong beliefs and i and i just think that that wwf wwf audience would have accepted them as two different teams not not looking at them as similar um, as far as a conversation with Vince, you, you don't, do you recall any conversation with him about any sort of correlation between the two gimmicks? No, not really ever. Uh, the, now obviously there were a lot of comparisons with powers of pain. Yes. But let's hear what that sounds like. Well, it's just, no, it's just, you, you look at the powers of pain and you look at the road warriors. They, they looked alike. They were both big bodybuilder teams. Demolition, neither one of those guys were bodybuilders. They didn't have that big look, and they were more, they were more of a working team, whereas the Road Warriors and Powers of Pain were more of a kicking and stomping and punching team. It wasn't that there were differences and big enough differences that, I didn't compare them. I mean, I really didn't. I, I see where people do because of the face paint. Well, and the spikes. And I realize that the spikes are certainly different. You know, and, and one wears shoulder pads and one doesn't. But um, the black leather, the spikes, uh, the face paint, I could see how a lot of people would make that correlation. And I can see how people would make that correlation as well. Um, then the bell rang. June of 02 was all about John Cena in the WWE. This is when he starts to really hit his stride. He works a house show with uh, Crash Holly on the 7th. On the 8th, he is uh, taking an L from Albert on Velocity. On the 9th, he's working a house show again with Crash Holly. Uh, and he would also do Heat that day with uh, Shelton Benjamin in a dark match. Uh, he would do that again on the 16th with Scott Vick, this time getting the win. On the 22nd, uh, he would work against Tommy Dreamer and take the loss, but then defeat Shelton Benjamin on Velocity in a dark match, um, and then return the favor on Heat, where Shelton Benjamin would go over in a dark match for Heat. So this is a, a lot of matches here in a hurry on the main roster. Is this kind of the final uh, polishing piece, and what is happening behind the scenes to get John Cena ready. Obviously, we know we're giving him some ring time. He's working in front of the lights, in front of the cameras, in front of the big crowd, in the big ring. But what behind the scenes is happening to get John Cena ready for his debut? Well, it's time to you know fish or cut bait. So it was this was during a time for both John Cena and for Shelton Benjamin too at this time to see get them out on the road, let different agents have the opportunity to work with them. Let them work with some different talent. Let all the other talent get to see them and get their input. And it was just that fish or cut bait time. Get them out on the road and let's see how they do. Uh, you can 
work one way at television, and then you're going to work a different way in house shows. So this was an opportunity to get them on house shows and get them in front of a paying audience, see how the audience responds, see how the agents and, and talent respond to them as well. And then you make your decisions. Well, and it finally happens. Uh, it happens on June 27th, 2002, which is why we're covering him today. Uh, the 15-year anniversary of John Cena's debut will be this coming Tuesday, the 27th. He makes his debut here against Kurt Angle. And this all comes after Vince McMahon has started to talk about ruthless aggression. Uh, and that's actually what he described that it took to get rid of WCW was his ruthless aggression. And that's kind of a Vince McMahonism. Before we talk about the debut, when do you remember ruthless aggression becoming such a big deal within the company? Was anybody for it? Did anybody think it was hokey? Why did Vince love it so much? Because it was Vince's idea. You got to have ruthless aggression to succeed. And he was, you know, Vince would do these work shoot type things where in reality, Vince felt you had to have ruthless aggression if you wanted to make it. And you had to not care about your fellow man, and you had to step up and grab that brass ring and have ruthless aggression. So Vince cuts that promo to be able to inspire and get the, the talent off their ass, if you will. So that was, that was the whole idea behind it, to see who was going to step up. And anybody that stepped up hopefully would get that opportunity, and we were – making some changes at this point in time and looking for people to get out of their shell. This was at the same time we, we were trying to make the move with, with Bradshaw, uh, as a matter of fact, to get John to step up in that singles capacity and do something. So, um, of course, Angles in the Ring opens uh, or issues an open challenge to anyone on the roster, and Cena comes out. And Angle asks him, what's the one quality you possess that makes you think you can walk out here, come in the ring, and face the very best? And Cena says, ruthless aggression, and then slaps Kurt Angle, and they have a match. And Kurt's kind of given him a lot here. Um, you know, the clothesline, the power slam, the spine buster. It's a lot against Angle on your first night in when Angle is obviously one of the more decorated champions at that point. I thought it was a pretty hell of a debut for John Cena, was it not? I thought it was an excellent debut, and that's part of the... I don't know if John could have debuted with someone else and made quite the impact. A lot of that I give the credit to Kurt Angle, who was extremely unselfish and knew going out there that his job was to get this guy over. And I thought that Kurt did a great job doing it, and John stepped up to the plate. Later in that episode of SmackDown, Cena's shown backstage talking to Rikishi, Ron Simmons, and Billy Kidman, and they're all congratulating him on the match with Angle. Uh, and Rikishi says he's going to be a big superstar. And then The Undertaker, who's the undisputed champ at the time, came up to Cena and said, What's your name, kid? And Cena responds with John Cena. Undertaker repeats his name, takes his glasses off, and shakes Cena's hand and says, Nice job, and walks away. Uh, Cena just stands there smiling and looking at his hand. That It's a big deal that he, he was acknowledged by The Undertaker. Pretty big deal for this to be done here, and I find it kind of interesting because The Undertaker, I believe at this point, was a heel. So whose idea was this for it to happen, and who, I guess, decides to sprinkle some Undertaker dust on Cena right away? I believe it was Paul Heyman's idea for Undertaker to, to come in and shake his hand and, and endorse John Cena. Because it, it was, it was unique, and Taker was a heel, and Taker was the man. So if he got the endorsement of, you know, the big dog in the yard, then the audience might think, oh, hey, this guy may be something special. And I thought it was beautifully done, and it did help. It did help sprinkle Undertaker dust on Cena, get him moving in the right direction. Uh, Brian Alvarez put the segment over really, really huge, the segment with Angle, saying that it was great and um, that he thought Flair or that Angle did his best to make a superstar in one night like Flair did in the 80s and that he gave one hell of a performance that night. How much of John Cena's success should be credited to Kurt Angle not gobbling him up and making him look stupid in that debut? Because he certainly could have. 
And I know that's not necessarily in Kurt Angle's character, but in a generation prior to this, it would have crossed their mind to just guzzle him, would it not? I think that the you know, the opportunities there, and trust me, if Kurt Angle wanted to guzzle you, he would. But I think that Kurt, being the professional that he is, the true pro, you know, went out and did his job and, and made a new star in John Cena. Um, they do an angle where Jericho is talking smack about the way Cena dresses and his haircut. And he says something like, what type of ruthless aggression do you have, Junior? And Cena slapped him down. And this starts their program. Um, before we move on to talk about this angle, we should mention that at this era, Cena is wearing bike shorts and boots to kind of match the local sports team. So if they were in Pittsburgh, he'd be wearing black with yellow trim. If they were in Green Bay, he'd be wearing yellow with green trim. Um Whose idea was this? How white meat babyface was this? And who talked him out of this? This was all John Cena's idea. And John wanted to do something unique and different everywhere he went. He bought all new trunks and all matching boots. Uh, I saw the closet in his dad's house of, of all of those outfits. And he wore a different one every single night. So that was Cena's idea and just something that he wanted to do. Um... Do you remember any sort of controversy about the Chris Jericho slapping segment? <laughs> because let, let me, I'm, I like that you're laughing. Let me just go ahead and read right from Alvarez. He says, there was a huge controversy regarding an angle with John Cena that got nixed. If you saw SmackDown, Jericho gave Cena lip and got a hard slap for his troubles. The original angle involved Cena slapping Vince and everyone who heard the entire plan Thought it was awesome and would get Cena over as a superstar. Even or enter Triple H. He did not think this would be such a great idea. Instead, he felt this green youngster should be taking finishing moves from the top guys. He also thought it was absurd that anyone would seriously slap his boss across the face. Plus, he said nobody should even touch Vince until his match with Hogan at SummerSlam, and Vince ended up siding with Hunter. There were guys backstage outraged when the word of the change got to them. So I want to know what's real, what's rumor, and what's innuendo. Well, first of all, the just there probably was the idea to slap Vince, but it it made no sense because of where we were going with Hogan and Vince, and I don't know that that it made it past the discussion stage. So it probably sounds like whoever's I, whose ever idea that was that they got out and said, "Wouldn't this have been better if he slapped McMahon?" Or something like that. I don't know how that would have gone. But the the whole idea was you slap Jericho and then maybe get something going with Jericho. Now, I produced that that bit. I believe we were in Boston because I, I know that I can see the room right now where it was. And I remember John was so nervous. And this is John's second appearance on television. And I said, listen, you you've got to knock the shit out of Jericho. I said, you can't do a work slap. You've got to slap the shit out of him. You got to light him up. And I told Jericho, I said, Chris, I said, he's going to slap the shit out of you and he's going to light you up. So just telling you it's coming. So they're standing there with Vince and John and Jericho fed him, man. You know, Chris was just like, don't hit my ear, don't break my eardrum, man, don't knock my teeth out. Well, John throws his slap <laughs> and no shit knocks Jericho on his ass about three feet back. That was not uh, a stunt fall. That's a shoot. Got knocked down. 100% Jericho fucking goes, what the fuck, man? And... Go, God damn, learn to work. And then Vince was like, God damn, pal, you can't be can't be throwing live rounds like that. But I told him to do it, and I told him it was coming. Well, in fairness, there is a difference between slapping someone and, and about and- killing someone. <laughs> John, I gave John's you my- so damn worked up that I mean he oh good God. It was brutal. And Jericho's looking at me like, fuck you, you take that slap. I'm like, uh-uh. Yeah. It was, it was a little snug. 
to say the least. Uh uh-uh, uh, my ass. John Cena didn't want none. You're a three time karate black belt Hall of Famer. Yeah, I don't want none of that either. Um, so do you remember this story about Vince and, and Hunter getting it changed? No, like I said, I think it was just an idea that was brought up that I think everybody kind of shit on because what do you do with it? Well, we had the whole, the whole idea was we were going with Vince and Hogan. We weren't going with Vince and Cena and it was a new guy put Cena with somebody that he can have a match with. The line about who would think it's believable that you could slap your boss across the face cracked me up, though. Who would think it's okay to stun your boss, make him pee his pants on live TV, spray him with a beer? No, that's that, that's different from a guy, an established guy, and a guy that's his second week on TV. And again, the whole the basic premise of it is Vince was with Hogan. We no, didn't no, want I, to go somewhere else. With I get it. It's just. It was an excuse for Alvarez to take a shit on Triple H, and that's not what sure. we do on this show, right? That's right. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna. No, I'm not gonna take a shit on something that isn't there and I'm, doesn't have any fucking credibility. I'm just busting. He balls, wasn't Bruce. there. Calm down. Don't serve me tonight. Am I gonna have to do a, a, a fuck? What's the guy's name? Uh, a fuck? What's the guy's name? What's the, what's the guy? Alvarez. What's his first name? Brian Alvarez. Am I gonna have to do a FB, uh, FBA? What is that? Shirt. Fuck Brian Alvarez shirt. Oh, that's hurtful. Why would you even suggest that? I don't know. Because he wasn't there either. Oh, gosh. Here we go. Um, The July 4th SmackDown is what we're talking about here. Cena wrestled Chris Jericho. It's the second ever televised WWE match. Brian Alvarez would write... Uh, Jericho beat Cena. Jericho did a great job with him, giving him near fall after near fall before finally pinning him using the ropes. Jericho offered to shake hands after the match, but then sucker punched him. Cena responded by hitting him with the protoplex to a big pop. Even though he's lost his first two big matches, people are going to take him seriously because he's allowed to be more than competitive against top stars. So far, so good. Uh, what were the plans for Cena at this point? Now, Normally, I would beat you up about, hey, let's push the guy. Let's have him lose. But he's losing to former world champions who are at the peak of their career. And you're putting him with Angle and Jericho, who could probably have a five-star match with a broomstick. Not six and a quarter stars unless they were in Japan, but you go, you get where I'm going. Um, who was an advocate for Cena you know, at this point in, in pushing him this way? I was, Heyman was, um, I think everybody was because he was new. And that, you ask what the plans were, there were no plans. We wanted to get him on TV. And we wanted to get him out there and see what he could do. And he delivered. Uh, he, he hung with Angle and he hung with Jericho. The, the plan was, we had no plan. The plan was, get him on TV and we'll figure it out after the fact if he catches on. And he got reactions and started catching on to those great matches that he had with both of those guys. So a lot of the credit, you know, goes to Kurt Angle and a lot of the credit goes to Chris Jericho for being able to go out and have the matches that they had with Cena when if you were to put him with someone equal, he wouldn't he wouldn't have had. So we just wanted new talent. We were so, so desperate for something new. And let's get him out there. We'll figure it out after we get him out there. Cold turkey can be great on sandwiches, but there is a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or some stories from Marty Gennetti. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume. And they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Well, Fume is an innovative, award-nominated device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses natural, delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy. And it makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your Fume comes with adjustable airflow dials and... It's designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, you know, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful 
or de-stressing or anxiety while you're trying to break that habit. And I have to admit, my wife was a little skeptical of this at first, but buddy, she loved the flavor way more flavor than she expected. She really enjoyed the crisp mint, but they've got tons of other flavors too, like white cranberry. They got maple pepper. How about sparkling grapefruit, orange, vanilla, raspberry, lemon, so many different flavors for you to choose from. You'll also notice that it feels great. It's well weighted. It's perfectly balanced. It is fun to fidget with. It's also made of beautiful, real wood. And it's a shape that, I don't know, you just feel cool using it. Here's the reality. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to fume, man, it's easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use the code WRESTLE to save 10% when you get the journey pack today. Let's try FUM and use the code WRESTLE to save an additional 10% off your order today. One more time, tryfume.com slash WRESTLE and use the code wrestle to save an additional 10% off your order today. The decision to have Paul white debut this way. When did you guys come to that as a way to debut him? Shoo. I don't know. Um, that was a, that was a a decision obviously that, that Vince McMahon and Russo had talked about in the way to introduce him. There was some debate about doing it here because the logical then next step is you want to see that match. And we weren't going there at WrestleMania. You know, I was like, see, that's what I struggle with. First of all, it doesn't feel like the original finish for this match. Do you know if another finish was ever discussed? (sighs) Not one that I heard. And, you know, I knew that we had been talking to Paul and negotiations had been going back and forth. And then I knew when we got him, but people started talking about how to, how to bring him in. And for example, my idea was not to bring him in until after WrestleMania and bring him in right on top, going after Austin. Did let him, you know, God damn, he'd been off TV. Let him stay off TV. Let him percolate. People forget about the giant. And then he comes out and destroys Austin after WrestleMania. And you've got a a ready-made match there. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. Don't get me wrong. I love the spot. I absolutely love the spot and the whole way that it, it worked and it was flawless. But as far as the introduction of a major character like that, it was pretty cool. But he wasn't successful. You know, basically he helped Steve win the fucking match. Um, just a lot of philosophical things that I did not necessarily agree with, but that was Vince McMahon. That's how he wanted to do it and felt this was the time for him to make a big impact. And just him being there was the impact and didn't think people would care about, well, Austin won and it was big show that threw him, you know, threw him out. Well, forget about that. Chocolate and vanilla. It seems so weird to me because I thought the same thing you did. Like if you're not going to do anything with big show and, um, stone cold, why have this as a finish? And it also felt weird to debut on a pay-per-view at the time to me, because it does feel like something you would want to do on raw. Clearly the Monday night wars or whatever you guys are winning weeks and months in, in a row here. But it does feel like something you would have tried to do because he's coming from the other channel instead of doing it on a pay-per-view. Do you remember, was any other way discussed about possibly debuting big show? Well, like I said, I mean, my idea was to debut him the night after WrestleMania on raw and have him come out and destroy Austin. No, I mean, besides, I'm like, I know that was your idea. I don't mean to be dismissive of that, but did, did Russo say, what if we did that? Cause you've also said that Russo was sort of Vince's right hand man for some of the creative at the time. Do you remember? Oh, definitely he was. Do you remember Russo having a different pitch that for whatever reason they said, nah, let's just do it here. I I don't know if it was Russo or McMahon's idea because from them, I always heard pretty much a unified front as far as debuting him here at the Valentine's day massacre. I don't know internally if they discussed anything else. 
from from them to me. And our Vince McMahon and I had this talk at the TV studio when we first brought Paul into the office and introduced him to everybody. And Vince and I went back and forth on it a little bit. He said, because I understand that you uh, you're thinking bringing him in a little differently. And I said, yeah, I said, I just don't. We know where we're going. We've got it. We don't need anything else to get to WrestleMania with Steve and Rock. So why do we need him now? You know, this minute for this pay-per-view, for this match. And he says, Bruce, it's impact. It's, it's the first time you see him, he makes impact. So, but it's not a positive impact. He's failing with his impact. No one will remember that. Um, so, okay, you know, great. Let's go make this the best it can be. But I don't, I think that for the most part, a lot of people felt it was a little lackluster because he, he failed <laughs> as best I could say. And there was also a feeling with big show that he wanted to work big show wanted to wrestle. He wanted to show people that he was more than just a giant, that he was a big man that could actually have matches. Well, that's great. And he's turned into a pretty damn great worker. At the time, he wasn't that worker that he thought he was. And he was a giant. He was a novelty. He was an attraction. And I felt he should have been treated a little more special than throwing him into the mix and into the fire the way they did. But let's talk about the actual execution of this. How the fuck do you sneak a seven foot, 400 pound dude under the ring in the middle of the show? It's out there all night. Holy shit. That's what I needed to hear. The big show was out there from the time the doors opened for the fans to come in all the way till the end of the night. Yeah. Welcome to the big leagues kid. Right. Yeah. Here's your Gatorade bottle. Oh, he had a, he had a few of those had an ice chest. He had, uh, had a box lunch. I think had a, a little mattress thing to, to lay on all covered up. He basically had a little condominium under the ring. So it's like he built a, a, a children's fort under the fucking ring and yes. it's there for hours and hours and hours. And this is his first night in the new company. Now, obviously he left WCW because, and we're going to do a whole big show show. I'm sure one day. But he leaves WCW because he's not happy with his contract. So he's got the money side like he wants, but your first day in get the fuck under the ring. See you in five hours. It wasn't like we didn't give him a box lunch and some waters and some place to pee. All he right. had a TV. He but could watch the show. Didn't one. even have to pay for the pay-per-view. Well, Vince probably took it out of his check. Now the, the rumor in the is the once upon a time. Big show took a shit so foul under the ring that people were vomiting. He didn't take a shit at this show, right? Cause that would just be the best possible way to make your debut with a new company. No, I don't believe he took a shit this show. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the big show. I'm sure another time, I, this whole story fascinates me. I'm really excited to, uh, to cover it sometime. Uh, who do you remember coming up with the little tidbit? about the cage collapsing. Is that a Russo idea? Cause it's fucking incredible. I think it was, it had to be one of the Vince's <coughs> pardon me. Uh, it had to be one of the Vince's and that's where the first time I heard it, I heard it first from Vince McMahon. And that's when we were discussing the whole Paul white issue and the name I always hated. I hated the name, the big show at first didn't get it. Didn't like it. I thought, God, Vince, it's so hard to say the big show. Now I can't imagine him with any other name. But when he came out, it was, what do we call him? Who do we say? We're not going to call him the big show right out of the box. And Vince opted to, to call him his name. He said, we didn't want to do the, who is this man? This giant of a man. Didn't want to do that bullshit. So just call him by his name, which I disagreed with too, but it was better than who is this man or, Oh my God, it's the big show. Nobody, people go, no, it's a giant from WCW. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's him. So of course the meeting goes well, uh, they have a private talk and go for a walk and, um, they come back and the housekeeper brings over a plate of brownies and it's sort of a surreal experience for Jericho. And of course he doesn't resign with WCW and he says the WWF offer is three years at 450 grand a year with an intricate system based on bonuses, you know, which is going to be reflected by the attendance and pay-per-view buys. Meanwhile, when Eric finds out that he's talking to you guys, uh, Chris starts to see offers from WCW where they're even reaching the magical seven figure threshold, but he says he would have worked for the WWF. Even if it was for half the money, he knew that that's where he wanted to be. And when he actually did make the decision and go ahead and sign the contract, they announce it on the website. Uh, a month before the contract was up in WCW. And I don't think that that's something that happened very often back then, because especially when you consider the way you're going to debut him, is this more of a testament to the Monday night war and the competition between WWF and WCW that you just can't wait to, ha ha, we got another one, put it on the website. No, it was more of a experiment of sharing information and the instant gratification with information that was going on at the time with that thing called the internet. So a lot of it was new. WWF.com was new. And there was thought of, look, the other dirt sheets would probably have it out there. Why not beat them to the punch and have our website that have that be the main source of information for our audience instead of going out and finding it elsewhere. So it, it runs that happy medium of it's going to get released anywhere. Anyway, we might as well release it ourselves. Well, he's constantly making calls to Russo pitching ideas. What about this for my debut? What about this for my character? What about a feud like this? And eventually he finds himself at the post office, dropping off some mail and he sees a clock on the wall counting backwards and underneath the clock, it says countdown to the new millennium. So to keep you sort of caught up here, it's six months prior to the year 2000 and the clock is keeping track of the time. So, you know, we're tracking new year's Eve. So like 176 days, 17 hours, eight minutes, 12 seconds, 11 seconds. And he thought, man, that'd be a cool way for somebody to debut in the WWF. Well, why not me? So he calls Vince Russo and, and pitches the idea of running vignettes with like a countdown clock for a debut, his debut in the company. And Russo calls him the next day and says, not only did Vince love the idea, but he's going to calibrate the clock to start a month before the debut. And it's going to hit zero at the exact moment of his first appearance, which was 20 years ago today, August 9th, 1999. When did you first hear about this idea? Cause it is. A pretty cool idea, especially at the time. I thought it was ingenious and it was a big way making a big splash. And this is how, how much you live inside the bubble sometimes. And, and here the year 2000 is coming up and everyone is talking about what's going to happen to all the computers, to all the clocks, to all the mainframes all over the world when they've all been set for 1999 and and when they reach, when it all zeroes out at 2000, everything's going to stop working. Planes are going to fall out of the air. It's going to be this major catastrophic event. Y2K, you know, this is, this is just going to be a disaster. So there was a lot of fear in the country and the all over the world as to what's going to happen. And now we've got this countdown clock and it's not to the end of the year. It's it's going to be in August and everybody's wondering what the, what the hell is this going to be? But again, as I was getting the point I was making is, is I had to actually just search to figure out what that term was, because to me, it's always been Y2J because it was ingrained in my head so much My gosh, that I forgot that Y2K. I, I think that, you know, again, wrestling fans would probably, they probably still, if you were to ask them, what was that thing called at the end of, uh, 
1999 that they were all afraid of. Oh, Y2J. Yep, that's old Y2J. He was going to get in there and fuck up all them computers. I know he was. Can't trust them people that long hair. So Chris uh, goes to the WWF offices about a month prior to the debut, and he's there in Stanford, Connecticut, and he meets with Jim Johnston, who I think most people listening to this know wrote a lot of the superstar theme songs. And he's having a conversation with Jim about who he was and what his character's attitude was, and he's trying to get sort of a vibe of the way the music should sound. And then he meets with Kevin Dunn, and they're talking about maybe what the entrance video looks like. And he plans to use a double blast of pyro to give the arrival extra impact. And he's going to take some promo shots and go meet with the merchandise folks. And he says, it feels like he's stepped into Oz because now, you know, this is a much bigger machine and it's working much differently than the way WCW had. And, uh, when he finally sits down with Vince McMahon and Vince's office, he throws him a script out of his desk for the movie toxic Avenger number four where he says there is a part written specifically for him. And he says something like you've been here for a day and you're already a movie star. And, uh, then he hits him with the big bombshell. The idea is to have this countdown to the new millennium clock reach zero right in the middle of a promo by the rock. And that means obviously there are big plans for Jericho chat me up about why him debuting in the middle of a rock promo was the right call. If you're going to make a splash and you're going to make a first impression, you might as may well make the biggest one that you possibly could. And rock was the biggest star in the company at the time. In addition to that, the rocks promos were probably the most entertaining at the time. So if you're going to interrupt anybody and you're going to come out and state your case, you might as well do it with the biggest audience and the biggest star, biggest platform that you possibly can. Well, that was going to happen for sure. We should mention that, um, the debut is going to happen here at the Allstate arena in Chicago. One of the more famed WWE arenas, especially in this era. And he's got a pair of Harley Davidson leather pants on and a silver rave shirt. And, uh, he's got a top knot and the Billy goat beard that he's grown out special for this occasion. And he bumps into Vince getting coffee. And as Vince sort of looks him up and down, he says, it's cheap heat Vince. And Vince says, indeed, with a weird look on his face and struts away. And he goes over his promo with Russo and he doesn't have any major concerns. The rock joins them and they're rehearsing the whole thing once in catering. And that's it. They both have done this before. So you don't need much more preparation than that. Do you remember meeting with Jericho or working with him at all that day on the, on the debut? Not anything more than saying hello, wishing him luck and telling when to go out. Um, the, the creative that was all done with Russo and him and rock. And it was one of those moments that the audience was waiting for, because they all knew there was anticipation. Is it going to be Jericho is going to be somebody else. It was still during that time that big moves meant something. And this was a big move. This was a major acquisition that had been with the competition before and we wanted it to be a big splash. But I think that when they had the, the video wall up and the whole animation getting there with the ball rolling down and, uh, that big reveal of Y 2 J and they knew exactly who that was and, and we're happy. You know, you saw the Jericho and all that shit and it just, it was good stuff. It was good stuff. And, uh, what a big way to debut right there with the rock in the middle of the ring. And of course, Jericho's going to come out to a huge ovation and start doing his promo. And remember he's interrupting the rock and, uh, the rock asks him what his name is. And then of course he says, I told you it's in the rock pops off. It doesn't matter what your name is. A lot of people would look at that and say, boy, the rock's really owning him here. This is not the right way you debut a guy. And it's been debated a lot that maybe 
obviously I know your take and this is going to be different, but a lot of people would say, man, if you're just going to have him come out in the rock clown him and say, it doesn't matter what his name is. That's not how you get a guy over, but I have a feeling you're going to have a different take on that. Oh yeah. It's totally killed Austin and Mick Foley <laughs> and everybody else that he ever worked with. Yeah. It's just terrible. That's just the worst. Well, I mean, I would, he, he should have just come out and pinned the rock the first night and, and then beat everybody in the company the, 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 on the very same night. We should have had a gauntlet of every single guy on the roster and beat them one, two, three in the middle of the ring that night and take every belt and put it on him and never have him lose another match. Is this right now? I'm not sure. Am I, am I talking to Bob Holly right now? I'm, I'm just saying what apparently everybody thinks that we should have done since we shouldn't put him in the ring with the biggest goddamn star in the company at the time and have him banter back and forth and have more eyeballs on him than he ever did working with Hoovy, some guy named Hoovy Tude, uh, years before. I love that you remember the Hoovy Tude shout out. Oh yeah. Uh, What's the feeling, you know, after the segment, it's a, it's a 6.53 rating in this segment. And, uh, he comes back through the curtain, you know, what's the, what's Vince's reaction. A lot of people come back through the curtain and they're looking for a nod from the chairman. Do you think Vince was pleased? Yeah, I think he was, uh, for me, uh, I was extremely pleased. I thought that he was able to hold his own and was right there. There were a few missteps where he was tickled by some of the shit that rock was saying, and you can catch him laughing and some of that stuff. But at the same time, some guys get flustered in that position and Chris didn't miss a beat. He was able to hold his own and, and hang in there with the rock. And that's what it was. That's what it was meant for. He was either going to sink or swim right off the top and he swam. Square garden. I've got Kurt angle in the ring, cutting a promo he's undefeated and he's been pushing, uh, the three eyes. So he's going to do that to the, this New Yorker crowd. They're having nothing to do with it. And then the heartbeat and the orange show up on the screen and fans who are online know what's coming. Here comes T a Z Z. Uh, what do you think of this, this, this match? Because this is going to be a match that a lot of people are going to point to and say, this is the beginning of the end for Taz and in the WWF. I thought the match was decent. It was all right. It wasn't, it wasn't great, but it was a good match. It was a solid match from two, you know, two guys that worked that style. Um, it wasn't terrible, but it just was. I think Taz had, uh, in the garden and maybe I think he had psyched himself out a little bit. It's a big deal going into the garden for your first time and yeah, kid from against, Brooklyn, especially against an Olympic gold medalist who's undefeated. I mean, that's, you know, I know, I know one of those things is sort of wanking and odd undefeated, but Olympic gold medalist is legit. And he's also compared to Taz, as far as being a, an in-ring competitor fairly green. I mean, this isn't the Kurt angle of 2019. This is a young Kurt angle. It was. Yeah. And it was somebody that, that we had high hopes for. And I think that Taz, you know, it just, I don't know. I think that their styles were a little too similar and it just didn't mesh for whatever reason. And again, I don't know that Vince had ever seen Taz work. Well, he saw it this night and Taz has done interviews over the years where he says, he saw Shane McMahon right before he goes out and Shane says, Hey, uh, can you retape your wrists? We don't, we don't really want to put FTW on TV. And this is right in the middle of the attitude era, you know, where, you know, Austin's coming to the ring, wearing a BMF on his jacket and on video cassettes that the company would release. Uh, JR would ask Austin, Hey, what does BMF stand for? And unedited on this video cassette, Austin would say bad motherfucker. So it is weird that on pay-per-view we're asked to not show the FTW. And then there's a spot in the match that would be pretty controversial. There is, uh, an attempted suplex by Taz where I think some would argue that, um, Taz 
what his time Taz's timing was off. Others would say maybe Angle was overzealous and trying to go too fast and he wanted to maybe help Taz more than Taz just muscle him up. And it looks like he's gonna drop Angle on his head. That doesn't happen. He sits him down, starts it over, and then completes the move. But even in the match write ups, that would be discussed. And supposedly that leads to a, a sit down the very next day. Like when Taz gets to the building the next day, you and Vince and Briscoe and a few others are waiting to talk to him. What was it about this match that got you guys attention and, and made you say, Hey, Taz, you, uh, got to work a different style here. Oh yeah. We all waited at the door waiting for him to get there. All of us. No, Jerry Briscoe and I talked to Taz and Again, guys, Taz had a reputation coming in. Taz has had a reputation of working stiff. And to some guys, some of the suplexes where he would let guys go and shit didn't feel safe. And from the night before, working with Kurt, one of our top guys, you go, okay, look, man, it looked like you lost him here. And if you're not going to do the stuff safe, we don't want you doing it. We only want you to do this stuff that's going to be safe, make it look good. But we don't drop guys on our heads here. And you got to take care of your opponent. That's the extent of the conversation. No more, no less. How did Taz, Taz got it? How did Taz take it? I think he was a little taken aback. You know, he's like, that's my style. That's what I do. It's like, look, we're not trying to take away your style. We're just telling you that either do it safely or don't do it. And if the guys are uncomfortable taking it, nobody's going to want to work with you. If, you know, if you're going out and, for whatever reason, somebody gets dropped on their head. They're looking at the guy delivering the maneuver. And that's not a reputation. And that's not, that's not the rap you want. Let's Austin's not going to get in the ring with him. If he's dropping people on his head. Well, and, and you may be on to something when you said, you know, it's his first time in the garden because Taz has said that, you know, on his ride to the arena, cause it's a, it's a, it's a drive in for him. He lives in New York. Uh, he's pretty emotional on his ride in and he, he picks up his phone and calls Paul Heyman and, um, he's supposed to be really excited, but he feels sort of guilty about going here, knowing that he's probably supposed to be doing something with ECW and it's probably fairly weird for him because he says he had three goals in wrestling. One was to make a living. Two was to hold any championship belt and three was to wrestle in the garden. And now he's about to check all those boxes but he's probably in his own head a little bit. Like, am I going to be the same performer without Paul Heyman's presentation? And maybe he was second guessing himself a little bit. And Paul psychs him up, even though Paul's feelings are probably hurt that he's leaving and he gets him ready for the match and he goes out and has the match. But again, he's overthinking it on the way to the ring. We would hear in years later, Taz would say he knew when he heard the reaction from the crowd. And by the way, go watch the tape Royal rumble 2000. When they reveal that Kurt Angle's opponent and the guy coming to shut his mouth as he's talking about the three eyes in the ring is Taz, it's a big pop from the hometown crowd. And it's, it's a surprise and it's a big moment. But Taz says in hindsight, he knew right then as he's walking to the ring, he was doomed. Like it wasn't a WWE creation and they're cheering me. They're never going to fucking push me to this level. And I know you're going to take issue with that, but a lot of guys like Bill Goldberg, when he came in for his first run, that was certainly his testament. What would you say to uh, a Taz in 2000? Who's like, well, I got a big reaction, but it was too big. So they're not going to push me. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay. We don't want anybody to get over. He's over. So let's kill it. That's stupid. Well, I, I understand. And I knew you would say that, but. You're, are you going to really say that there, that every, every idea about there being a discussion of, well, if it got over and it wasn't our idea, so therefore we don't like it. That's all bullshit. Oh that's yeah. That's what we say. Oh yeah. Well, this is over, but, but, but we don't like it. Cause somebody else says stupid. Think of what you're saying. That's stupid. Why would you do that? Well, I'm mean, just saying you did a lot. Oh yeah. Well, okay. No, we didn't different audiences, different reactions, different times, different people. And it's, uh, that's a stupid way of doing business. And that's not, 
not the case. And I'm sure that you and everybody else and Dave Meltzer and Taz and whoever may think that simply not true. So Bruce is on vacation and I can only hope that means he's putting some miles on that Peter meat. Thanks to blue chew. Let's talk about sex, boys and girls. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can be again, thanks to Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Roll Tide. And then the process is simple, y'all. You sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And boy, do we have a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code WRESTLE at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is WRESTLE, and you'll receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring today's podcast. And Bruce's Ding Dong. Let's get to our card. I'm excited for us to do this. First up is Sunday Night Heat. It aired uh, on the the preview channel and, of course, WWE.com. Of course, previously it was on the USA Network, but we're now off of the USA network, um, at least for Sunday night heat, but we know what's coming. William Regal and Paul Burchill are going to defeat Paul London and Brian Kendrick in five minutes and nine seconds. When London submitted to the Regal stretch after sustaining a shoulder breaker from Burchill, who had just recently debuted alongside Regal in hindsight, what's your favorite Paul Burchill story? Jesus Christ, his debut when he came in on the on the rope, and <laughs> here's a pirate, and we had the minis that were a part of it, and uh, the official executive from UPN was being interviewed when all of a sudden he was interrupted by a pirate swinging in and tearing, tearing up the set and coming in surrounded by a bunch of minis as they were known in the time. And it was just chaos. And as I finished doing it and I'm watching it back and Vince is there to watch it and he looks at me and says, God damn, you think maybe it's a, it's, it's a little too much. And I said, gosh, Vince, what the fuck is too much here? I mean, is it is it the pirate that comes sweeping in on a fucking uh, rope, or is it the pirate cutting cutting up the set? Is it the fucking minis that are humping the television executive's leg, or could it be the pirate going ah, matey? What the fuck is it? This too much. So, yeah, that was kind of my his debut was was the best. How about this though? I can't wait till we talk about that part in the road warrior episode where we talk about the fact that you made him tag with John Heidenreich, who's most famous for raping Michael Cole or fighting Alabama doink in a golden corral parking lot. I'm going with the Alabama parking lot. <laughs> what about, uh, what about M and M here? Fuck Alabama doink too. Jesus Christ. He fucking doink. He passed away. I, I understand that, but he was a con man. Let's fuck him anyway. Yeah. Wait, why was he a con man? I don't know Alabama doink. I don't, I don't know why he was a con man either, but he was never a fucking doink in WWE. He was never a doink ever, <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever. I love that. You got doink heat. That, that fucking pisses me off. I got doink heat. God damn it. It does. You know, to, and again, maybe it's because to me, there's only one doink and that was Matt Bourne, uh, Ray Apollo. Okay. Steve uh, Lombardi. Oh, God damn. Lombardi was when you needed a third doink to do some kind of bit. And then well, hang on now. To... didn't you get him huh? in doinks are us? Yeah, it, it was, that's what it became was doinks are us. 
But Kern was the original second doink. Um, <laughs> the original second doink. <laughs> 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 yeah uh like fuck that shit man there's only one doink and that was matt born kern was good at doink apollo was yeah yeah but he was okay just he inherited it and didn't have the same kind of style and charisma that matt born had in that character matt born made doink lombardi not a chance in fucking whoever the fuck Alabama doink is was. and whatever. Um, not even close. Never was a doink in WWE. Come on. Okay. I didn't know you had to get Gets hot me hot. It. See, what? now you got me hot. I'm sad we lost him. It's been, uh, Two years ago, we poured out a little bit of liquor here at the house for him. Rest in peace, Alabama doing. So after we see this phenomenal promo on SmackDown from Andy Guerrero, he's supposed to tag with Batista the next week against Eminem, but he's faking being sick. At least that's the implication. And Batista brings in a doctor who's going to give him a, this is real, a rectal probe without lubricant. And Batista holds Eddie down as Eddie makes the segment work with his verbal and facial expressions. And Batista's on track to win the match, but Eddie tags in after watching from outside the entire time and hits the frog splash. And he's going to sell his ass as he's celebrating with a confused Batista. Bruce, why are y'all having people stick shit up people's asses on SmackDown? You've never been anally probed? Is it? No, I'm not 40 yet. I think you start that at 40. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's about right. But you probably got a jump start on yours, right? I did not. Well, actually, I guess I kind of did, but I, I, I had issues down there at a young age. What was his name? Dr. Procto. Seriously. Who says, okay, guys, what if he faked sick? So we had a doctor come shove something up his ass and Batista holds him down. See, you go to the uh, ultimate crudest possible thing. We went to actual medical journals to decide what would a real medical professional do in this situation? Well, you can take so, his temperature through so listen, his mouth. Listen, 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 man. I got a doctor in the family. Oh yeah. All right. So I made a call. Okay. Dr. John Richards. What would happen if Dr. said, Dr. John said, well, if it was me, I'd anally probe him and you got to put some suppositories up there because suppositories pro tip kids, they get in your system a lot faster than any other type of medication other than injection. But I guess it kind of is an injection because it is rectally going up in there, but it dissolves immediately and gets into your system and can help you a whole lot faster than orals. So during COVID, you've had your butthole reamed out a few times? No, no sir. Well, Never you, had my butthole reamed out. You're just going to make sure you're not sick. But I'm not sick. Well, there's only one way to find out and that's rectally. You just told us that. No, there's not because I'm not, I don't have any symptoms. Eddie had a symptom. What was the symptom? He didn't feel good. Right up in the observer about your segment. Let's say Pritchard came out with his speech. Pritchard talked about how just a few years ago impact had so much hope, but it never happened. He said the TNA name is dead and the company will be known only as impact wrestling from this point forward. He said the company has a great hybrid wrestler as world champion and Lashley and that nobody can beat Lashley. And this was where Alberto came out and issued a challenge. Uh, Ethan Carter, the third also came out and said, there's no way Alberto deserved a title shot since he had never wrestled for the promotion. And he wanted Lashley. Lashley blew him off saying he'd beaten him so many times. He didn't deserve a shot. So he would be facing Alberto. This is not the only title that's, uh, being discussed. Cody's going to come out, throw down his GFW, uh, next gen championship and says, he's not going to leave. He's trying to 
challenge moose this i don't know man this is a little weird um the idea that we've got a gfw championship and then ultimately they're going to have a match for what they're calling the grand championship moose and cody and cody's going to accidentally super kick one of the judges they bring you out to be a judge i don't know this feels like there's just a lot going on is that fair to say that would be an understatement. Uh, you know, they were trying to reestablish and catch you up on everything right off the bat. Right. So there were major changes that were taking place, and they, they wanted you to forget the 10-year history, or God, more than that, a history of TNA and make you think this is all brand new and this is this is where we're going instead of gradually letting it kind of take place. However, they felt that let's get it out there and, and let's start now. And the more things change, the more people are going to want to tune in and see what's next. Talk to me about, you know, you get your first set of tapings under your belt. You're almost in this GM type role. What's the experience like? I mean, uh, you know, I know that you're, even though on, on paper and in theory, you're only there to be an on-screen character, but you do wind up sitting in on some booking meetings, I'm sure. And there's a lot of other guys who might be agents there. Like, I don't know, maybe a Borash or a Shane Helms, or maybe an abyss. Talk me through, I think maybe even Dutch Mantel was there. Talk me through what that looked like at the time. Well, I think that there were, I know there still was some talent that kind of looked to me as being actually the real GM. Um, but the reason, my reasoning for going into the production meetings was so I could see what the hell I was going to do the next day. Mm. And I could get that shit in my head. And I'd go to the production meetings and, and just my ears would perk up when they got to my segment and I could ask questions there. And then I didn't have to really deal with anybody <laughs> the rest of the day until it was time to do my stuff. And the beauty of it was once the production meeting was gone and everyone would leave, that was my dressing room. So I left all my stuff in there. I would take out the computer and I'd do a little bit of work and, um, just hang, just kind of hang out. It wasn't like catering was a good place to hang out because food wasn't that good, but uh, I still had my connections at Universal Studios so I could sneak over to the car commissary and get good food, and I could still go and ride a couple rides during the day. <laughs> so, shit, man, my life was good. And, and I tried to, because with the new regime Dutch was, you know, a guy in charge, Jeff and all those with the new regime. I didn't want to be seen as trying to, to ruffle any of those feathers or, or anything like that. So I stayed away from it because guys would come up to me and say, Hey, what am I doing? What would you suggest? And I didn't know exactly what those guys wanted. So I stayed away. I stayed away from the young guys. I said, Hey, go talk to Dutch. Dutch knows exactly what you're doing in this segment. He knows where you want to go or go talk to Jeff or go talk to Al Snow or Pat Kenny. And I did my, did my thing. And then we'd go and do our pre-tapes, knock them out and do my live stuff. And they'd have a little shuttle van there for me to take me back to the hotel. So I was well, what's the, what's the phrase? I shitting in tall cotton, something like that. Shitting in high cotton. There you go. High cotton, tall cotton, high Same cotton. Same thing. We got it. Uh, high cotton would, would, that gives a connotation. They were smoking marijuana or something. So I went with. Well, one of the things that, uh, nobody cared about at the time. <laughs> Creative decides to have a feud with Jeremy Borash and Josh Matthews. And you actually come out. And say that, Hey, we're going to have to settle this next week with a face to face. And, uh, you actually have a little bit of physicality in that segment. What do you remember about that? Who do I have physicality with? Well, you called me afterwards and told me that you'd taken a bump. 
Was that EC Thrizzle when he threw me on the ground? That bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you went from... And it hurt. You I went... hadn't taken... Dude, okay, you got to understand, at this point, I hadn't taken a bump in 10 years at right. least. More. At least. More. More, probably. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you just, you fall back into it, but uh, EC3 was supposed to basically just kind of knock me down. And he, he threw my ass and it like hurt. I was sore. I hadn't taken a bump in forever. And I, I had to call my mommy. I was going to tell on him, but no. Not only that, you know, this is a different deal for you. You know, I mean, these are marathon tapings where we're going back to back to back and it's a long day. You got the production stuff before you're up all, late the night before with all those guys in the production meetings. I mean, prior to this, I mean, you're floating around your pool, you know, this is a, this is a, a different deal for you to be walking around on concrete and dress shoes all day. Is it not? Yeah, that, that was drizzling shit suit. Yes. Well, having to be dressed. Sure. And wear a sport coat and things like that. And and that was challenging in and of itself. Because, you, folks, you got to understand, at this point in my life, I was a short and flip-flop wearing dude and wasn't really fond of a shirt and anything else on my body. So I just would hang out at the pool. I would go inside, do the podcast, kind of like I am right now in shorts and flip-flops and nothing else. Right. I you to visualize that. I have headsets on, talking into my microphone. But other than that, I just got a pair of boxers and some flip-flops on. So it, makes, it brings me back. See, it brings me back. And But now, then I've got to go, and I've got to put clothes on, and I've got to walk around, I've got to perform and then I got to go back and cool down and sit down and I got to go walk around again and do shit. And then this son of a bitch throws me on the ground. And I just, yeah, I hurt for a few days off of a bump. Think about that off of a one, <laughs> one a singular, singular bump. That wasn't, it was like, yeah, wasn't, it wasn't even a spectacular bump. Looked more like I just fell down, which basically I did. So, yeah. Let's, uh. But, but Josh, and, look, hey. Really? JB and Josh probably had the hottest angle on the show. I got to tell you, it is pretty interesting that the creative sort of is what it is. They're making Josh Matthews a heel. He's going to be trying to, uh, have a feud with, with Jeremy Borash. Wait, wait, wait. Let me make something very clear. They weren't making Josh a heel. Okay. He was a natural heel. Okay. Um, and he can't help himself, but on commentary, and I, I'm sure this is all the plan, but you know, he's rebelling against, you know, Karen and Jeff Jarrett and. You know, I mean, Jeff's not even appearing on screen at this point, but they are making it clear that Karen is married to Jeff and he's going to make fun of the Jarrett's bringing in guys like Bruce Pritchard and Dutch Mantell. And he basically says the only reason the fans are even here at TNA is because they're too cheap to buy tickets to see NXT. I, I don't, I mean, I guess we're, we're making an angle out of it's maybe an invasion. I don't know, but the idea that we're shitting our, our announcer is shitting on our fans saying, oh, they're, they're only here cause they're too cheap to buy tickets to the good show. W what the fuck? Well, I mean, we were going with reality television. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's just like, wait a minute. This is the plan. What is this now? Yeah, I think that the idea was to look at what they had done in the past and, yeah, and kind of go poo-poo all over it and and say, but what we're doing now is good. And, and that was kind of the idea about it. Don't ignore what 
you know, don't ignore what's out there. Just uh, embrace it and, and talk about it. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders. Plus new series like the book with David Crockett, Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch alongs, Q and A's and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And Hey, when you do the first week is completely free adfreeshows.com. <laughs> 